The first speaker is John Albert from Stony Brook University talking about bootstrapping large and confining gauge series. So hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm at Stony Brook working with Leonardo Rastelli and I'll be talking about uh, how to bootstrap large and confining gauge theories. So the starting point is uh, at some high energy scale. Uh, a confining gauge theory, which we parameterize as a collection of masses of the bound states and their on shell coupling constants. Okay. And now this is very analogous to the data that we use to describe um, CFDs, where we would have the scaling dimensions and the OPE coefficients. In the case of conformal field theories, which is a different case, uh, the conformal bootstrap uh, has been very successful in, in nailing down interesting CFDs. So the question is, given this analogy, can we bootstrap uh, confining gauge theories? So the bootstrap problem would be to consider the scattering of all these bound states in the theory. And then by demanding self-consistency, uh, conditions like crossing and unitarity, we would constrain these, these parameters here. So the, the problem would be for all the mesons, we have to start our, our bound states and we have to start somewhere and that somewhere would be the low, lowest lying state that, that I'm denoting by phi. And then in this con context, it's actually easier to use the language of effective field theory. So the idea is we integrate out all the higher states in the theory, and we are left with an effective field theory for the lowest excitations. And then this effective field theory that schematically looks like this has a collection of Wilson coefficients that are these, these Gs here that encode all this information. So now the problem is to use uh, the bootstrap, so consistency of this guy, uh, in order to put constraints on this and these coefficients and carve out the space of healthy effective field theories. It could look, look something like this. It could look something like this potato. Yeah. So um, uh, if we're lucky enough, as our friends from the conformal bootstrap were, then there might, this potato might have some interesting features that could correspond to interesting theories, uh, so confining gauge theories. It doesn't have to be the case, but wouldn't it be nice? Then, um, right, so just to make this story precise and sharp, we make the assumption of large n. And then what that does for us is that at low energies, it makes the effective field theory uh, weakly coupled. So each of these couplings is now down by one over n, and we can bound ratios of, of these guys. So that's nice because the methods that we use, positivity methods, are sharpest in the case of a weakly coupled BFTs. Okay. Now this is the general setup, and this uh, you know anti-confining gauge theory would fall in the in this setup. But the target that we have in mind is large NQCD. So we like to corner large NQCD with these methods. And that's you know the first thing we notice is that in the chiral limit, it has it undergoes this spontaneous symmetry breaking that generates a bunch of Golston bosons. So these lightest excitations in the case of QCD are the pions. So we consider the scattering of pions and we carve out this phase. And now I just want to flash uh, one of our results that's uh, a sli a 2D slice of this potato in the case of, of pion scattering. And you see, it, this is just uh, couplings that are not too important, which is uh, some order of four couplings. And we see that it, ha it has this complex phase with a bunch of corners. So the question is, does any of these, uh, can any of these correspond to large NQCD? And the answer is probably not. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so after, yeah, some play, playing with it a bit, it looks like most of these corners are actually explained by simple solutions to, to crossing. And we would like to go farther, like go, go past these this spurious solutions and, and try to zoom in onto wherever QCD is. So in order to do that, what we're exploring now is to enlarge the system and not just consider the scattering of pions, but also of the next excited state, which is the Romasm. So we consider this, this mixed system. And then something else that you can do that we've also been looking at is to uh, consider not just uh, mesons in the spectrum, but also probe photons. So probe photons would be like conserved currents. And what that does for us, for you, is that it knows about the symmetries of the problem. And not only the symmetries, but also the anomaly. So there's a chiral anomaly that drives this uh, neutral pi and decay. And that's something that we know we can match. So it's robust under RG flow. So we can match from the UV Lagrangian to the, to the EFT. And this is something that allows us to input uh, yeah, a quantitative feature of, of QCD. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Let me ask them. Or there was one. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I put bounds in the on the IR data, the, the Wilson coefficients. The, yes, but I can also I can also put bounds on on-shell couplings. That it's you know it's about the lowest mesons. Yeah, it's it's about it's mostly about IR. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, the space of CFT 
is usually limited to selling its catering sponsor at the street set, but for confining series, we need to expect that things are kind of variable. Yeah, I think that's why we're not finding an island or anything like that. But yeah, that's why we have to go beyond just crossing and and and, and that's why yeah, crossing a unitary. Then that's why we want to input things like the anomaly and so. But we, it's still not clear what are the the set of assumptions we need to single out QCD. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so the next speaker is Nathanael Barrell from Weizmann Institute of Science. Uh, UV limit of TT bar deformation. Uh, this is not my point. Go for it. Okay, the, we are continuing. Okay, so I will discuss about uh, correlation functions of local operators in the TT bar theory from topological gravity. Um, so I will have a short introduction, I will show some definition, and then I will show my result. So introduction is that the first sentence of Stoltzoid says that happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So I think that the first sentence on the QFT course should be the first sentence, local QFTs are all alike. Every non-local QFT is in non-local in its own way. So I will check one of the rare non-local theories that we know of. Uh, so as we know, the paradigm of QFT says that the RG flow is from CFT in the UV to CFT in the IR. Uh, however, in the TT bar deformation, people and I have managed to show that even if we start with CFT in the IR, we end with a non-local QFT in the UV. And so this is why it's interesting. So just a couple of the definitions. Uh, so uh, for every theory in one plus one dimension, we take the energy momentum tensor, we calculate its determinant, and then we modify our theory by adding to the Lagrangian the city bar uh, operator. And then we had another theory, which defines that the parameter, which is uh, instead of T, it's T plus T. And the, for this theory, you calculate again the energy momentum tensor, and then you modify again your Lagrangian, et cetera, et cetera. The parameter T serves as an RG flow parameter. Uh, and so people are calculating the leading order correction to correlation functions. And this is the leading order correction. And four years ago, Cardi was managed to show that the UV limit is something like this. As we see, this is like CFT, but this factor is definitely not a CFT factor because it's momentum to power of momentum. Um, and I wanted to verify this result since it's very weird in another frame which we are used to that was developed some by the work that sits here that uh, the TT bar uh, uh, deformation has another formulation in terms of the JT gravity which I will not have time to go into um, and this uh, the advantage of this description that it's non-perturbative rather the other uh, definition was uh, in, you increase your parameter perturbatively here it's uh, non-perturbative definition for every uh, parameter t. And then you can define local operators in this framework. And you want to calculate the uh, two-point correlation function. And I got this result, which was extremely so as, as like as Cardi's result except for the minus and plus sign, which is kind of a difference. And so we thought for a moment how it should be. And then we thought that since Carl used some kind of perturbation theory, its result is valid because he summed a perturbation series. So it's valid until some uh, value of the momentum. But if you want really the high momentum limit, then you get this result from the minus flip sign. It means that, uh, especially that the short distances, rather here you have a divergence, here you have some constant, which means that your theory smears a correlation that your uh, distances. Uh, this up to him. Uh, the partition function for T T bar deformed uh, theory suffers from some non perturbative ambiguities in the case of uh, the so called wrong sign. Uh, yeah, th th this is only for the right sign, only for, for positive T, for negative T, I didn't try to. Okay. 
Okay, the next speaker is uh, Valentin Benedetti from Instituto Valsera, uh, Generalized Symmetries in Arthur's Theorem and QFT. Oui. Well, uh, hi everyone. I wanted to tell you uh, about generalized symmetries and another theorem in quantum field theory, which is some work we did in collaboration with uh, Horacio Cassini and Javier Magan from Bariloche. The main question we have been trying to answer is when is there a well defined uh, nodal current for a continuous symmetry in quantum field theory? The answer a priori might seem really simple, says as Noren theorem asserts the existence of a nodal current when the action is invariant under a continuous symmetry group. But it's a long standing question in quantum field theory uh, to what extent this theorem holds. For instance, the problem becomes more clear when one considers some counter examples where the nodal current is not gauge invariant. In four dimensions, this is the case of a duality symmetry for the free Maxwell field. There's also the case of the Weinberg Witten theorem, which, for example, precludes the existence of a strong energy, energy tensor for particles of spin greater than one if they are massless. And there is a more involved case involving the current symmetry when one takes into account the ABJ anomalies. We also want to ask what is peculiar about the symmetry in these cases and learn what these examples have to teach you about, teach us about completeness of the spectrum in quantum field theory. The answers we found are related with the presence of generalized symmetries. To be precise, if a generalized symmetry is charged under the action of a continuous global symmetry group G, namely that there are some non-local operators that transform under the action of this symmetry, there, there cannot be another current for the zero form symmetry group G. This theorem follows from a proof that is based on characterizing twist operators that are always secure to implement the symmetry locally inside the region by a weaker version of another theorem. The going back of this proof, we have very strong arguments for it, uh, but all of them require that the theory in question can be properly UV completed. A nice feature of this relation is that it can be used to rederive uh, Weinberg Witten theorem. Uh, this is because we know that massless particles of spin equal or greater than one have emergent IR generalized symmetries that are one form symmetries. And in from a spin three half onwards, these are all charged and the Poincare group. Uh, another interesting aspect is that in algebra and quantum field theory, the non local operators are related to hack duality violations. And therefore, they always come in dual classes assigned to complementary regions. And in this case, that the generalized symmetry is charged, they both must form a, a continuum. Uh, there are here two cases. Of course, it's the case that the hack duality defects form a continuous compact group. In this case, um, this is an example of the ABJ anomaly and the chiral symmetry, where the chiral symmetry acting over the fermions or the pions locally uh, also transforms the top loops. And there's a more general case, which is the most common one, that is uh, the hack duality defects form a continuous non-compact group. In this case, we can prove that the theory is necessarily free, or it uh, has to be completed with charges that break down uh, all generalized symmetries. This, for instance, implies that there should be charges in any UV completion one can find from, for neutral or nonlinear electrodynamics or interacting Goldstone boson theories. Yes. In the case of the ABC anomaly, uh, well, you should take, for example, the example of the pion in the effective field theory. Uh, you have the Wilson loops, the usual ones, because the dual of uh, the field strain is conserved. And you also have the tough loops that involve the pion, and that transform under the action of the chiral symmetry when one thing to attain this redefinition of the, of the current taking into account the ABC anomaly. Uh, Ah, 3D, 3D. Uh, in 2D, uh, it's the Schwinger model. Ah, okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's thank Valentin again.
So the next speaker is Nick Geiser from UCLA. He will give us a brief review of Hunam Tuchi. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I will be giving a brief review of Kuhn Amplitudes as much as I can in the four minutes. And I'd like to thank the organizers before I start. Uh, so Kuhn Amplitudes are an old topic which actually date back to the prehistory of, of the strong interaction back in the dual resonance model days before we even had the theory of QCD. And here is just the citations of Kuhn's original 1969 paper. You can see a flurry of activity uh, in the 1970s, uh, relative dead period, some work in the 80s, and then pretty much nothing until very recently. And just in the last 18 months, there's been a few dozen papers citing Kuhn's original paper and looking into this very old topic in our field. Uh, so there is a long history, but like you saw, there's been lots of dead periods. So we can review it very quickly and look at some of the open problems. So Veneziano's discovery of the amplitude which started string theory was in 1968. Kuhn discovered a generalization of that amplitude uh, less than a year later in 1969. In the 70s, uh, Kuhn and his collaborators wrote down endpoint generalizations of his amplitude, developed an operator formulation, and looked at phenomenology, again, trying to study the strong interaction prior or, I guess, at some point in conjunction with QCD. Uh, there was an independent rediscovery in the 1980s by L.J. Romans, uh, but things were quiet until 2016, where a very nice paper looked at the Kuhn amplitude as a counterexample in the S-matrix bootstrap program. Uh, the modern studies have looked at some uh, open questions, including looking for a physical realization of the Kuhn amplitude, that is a world sheet model or an explicit QFT. That's still an open question, although there are some hints as to what that might be. Uh, people are also looking at generalizations of the Kuhn amplitude and studying its unitarity property. Again, all open questions. Uh, so let's move to four points. The Kuhn amplitudes are actually families of amplitudes parametrized by this uh, non-negative real number Q. At four points, you can write down the Kuhn amplitude as in terms of Q gamma functions. These are uh, well-known in the mathematics literature, generalizations of the normal gamma function. And when the Q goes to one, you just get the nice Veneziano amplitude that we all know and love. These alpha functions, which appear here, are Q-deformed Reggie trajectories. And the spectrum of these amplitudes are the so-called Q-deformed integers, this one minus Q to the n over one minus Q. The mu squared here merely sets the scale. It can be thought of as setting our units. And the delta is the offset for the lowest mode. Uh, for Q equals zero infinity, you just get a nice or an interesting QFT of scalars. Uh, but at Q equal one, like I said, you get the string amplitude where delta can be set to zero or minus one for the super or bosonic strings. Uh, for Q less than one, the spectrum has an accumulation point that is a highest mass. And the amplitudes are non-meromorphic because of these Q alpha alpha factors. For Q greater than or equal to one, the spectrum is unbounded uh, and the amplitudes are meromorphic. However, if you look at the perturbative unitarity of this amplitude, you find that unitarity imposes the condition that Q is less than or equal to one, and delta is in this nice little regime here. Um, and so just looking at this, we see the nice behavior is precisely at string theory, but there's still worthwhile uh, properties to study for the Kuhn amplitude for other values of Q. Um, and one can go to higher points, although you start to find problems. At five points, the Kuhn amplitude can be written in terms of Q hypergeometric functions, very complicated, but in such a way that returns the five-point string amplitude. Uh, for Q less than or equal to one and for a choice of special kinematics, you actually reproduce an amplitude which was studied quite recently in the literature by Cliff Chung and Grant Remen. Um, for Q greater than or equal to one, this formula has all the nice factorization properties that mimic that of the string on the world sheet. But for Q less than one, the nice unitary regime, there's an issue with factorization in some of the channels. Um, moreover, for n points, uh, n greater than five, there's only a nice generalization you can write down for the non-unitary Q greater than one case, uh, of course, ignoring string theory, which we all know and love at Q equal one. So thank you. Perfect timing. Uh, question, one question. Um, yes, please. Yeah, if you stay out of the unit circle, you can naively take these formulas for Q complex, uh, stay out of the, the circle itself. You can be within or without, um, but your formulas for the masses don't really make sense as stable particles. So there might be an interpretation as like bound states or decayed states, I don't know. 
Great, let's thank Nick again. So now continuing with the Kuhn Amplitude team, uh, there is a talk with two speakers, uh, Rishab Bardwaj and Shunak Day from Brown University on the unitarity of the Kuhn Amplitude. Hello everyone. So in the next four minutes or so, we're going to continue to talk about some more recent progress into the longstanding question about the uniqueness of the Veneziano amplitude. So the problem dates back to 1968 when Gabriel Veneziano wrote down his famous amplitude. And that came about as a consequence of the bootstrap constraints, namely the amplitude should be crossing symmetric in the Mandelstam's S and T, it should have polynomial residues, and it should have only simple poles in uh, the Mandelstam's S and T, which is the condition of meromorphicity. Uh, crucially, a year later, this amplitude was realized from a world sheet perspective, and that has led to more than half a century of string theory research. Uh, then a natural question to ask is, uh, if this amplitude proposed by Veneziano in 1968 actually unique? This question was asked by Kuhn, and the answer turns out to be no. One can consider, as Nick just mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, a deformation, a Q deformation of the gamma function that show up in the Veneziano amplitude. And as it turns out, this very well satisfies the bootstrap constraints as well. And the two unique features that this amplitude has is the nonlinear Reiki trajectories uh, denoted by alpha Q and the fact that it, it is a whole family of amplitude that runs from Veneziano at Q equals one to an ordinary scalar field theory amplitude at Q equals zero. More recently, uh, the amplitude has reignited interest from the perspective of unitarity. So a natural question to ask is whether this amplitude is unitary and the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, along with our supervisors, um, Marx Bradlin and Anastasia Volovich, we considered, we considered a partial wave unitarity expansion for the residue polynomial of this amplitude in terms of the D-dimensional Gegenbar polynomial. Uh, then the condition of unitarity turns into the condition of positivity the, uh, for the coefficients that show up in this expansion. Uh, in our paper, we uh, derive two key results. Uh, one, that these coefficients for the leading Regi trajectories and the subleading Regi tra trajectories are manifestly positive, and hence for this regime, the amplitude is, amplitude is unitary. However, the, the unitarity breaks down from the sub subleading Regi trajectories and beyond. As a particular example, uh, consider the figure shown here for the B3 zero coefficients in the QD parameter space. Uh, as you can see, the green region denotes uh, where this coefficient is positive and hence the Kuhn amplitude is unitary. But as one goes around Q equals one and D equals 10, you see this red patch appearing, highlighting the negativity of this coefficient and hence we lose unitarity for the amplitude. Uh, for more details, please, Look at our paper and we'll be happy to answer any questions later on as well. So uh, having established the unitarity of the Kuhn amplitude in certain regimes of the QD parameter space, we now turn towards asking a slightly bigger question, like does the Kuhn amplitude emerge from some string theory construction? And the answer is slightly has a negative tone, uh, at least in the case that we consider in some recent work in progress, so we start off by quantum deforming the global part of the world sheet conformal group, taking us to the realm of, sorry, taking, uh, sorry, yeah, taking us to the realm of uh, SL2C sub Q, the quantum group. And crucially, these quantum groups come equipped with uh, rich Hopf algebra structures. So using these Hopf algebra structures, one is able to construct Q deformed versions of conformal field theories. And using that, one can write down Q deformed correlators. And then using fancy uh, machinery of gauge fixing on the quantum fuzzy sphere, one can construct Q deformed amplitudes. And it turns out that these Q deformed amplitudes represent observables that, that bear no resemblance to the original Kuhn amplitude we set out to study. Thank you. Question. <clears throat> but what do you say to this <clears throat> construction using deep brains from Maldesen and Raman that seemed promising? Yeah, I, I mean, th that, 
there were some aspects that did not uh, like for example the rotating string still did not match the coon spectrum when you consider rotating strings that were attached to the deep brain uh, they did not exponentially approach the accumulation point which was still some a uh, sort of a backdrop to However, the accumulation point uh, like spectrum is a desirable desirable feature for uh, low energy eft theories of gravity and the, the, their work is, is 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 interesting from that point of view as well although it doesn't directly relate to the kuhn amplitude thank you <clears throat> okay the next speaker is anna biggs from princeton uh, quasi normal modes of the zero brain black hole solution. Okay. Uh, hi. So I'll be talking about D zero brains and their quasi normal modes. So, as you all probably know, there's a duality between ADS5, cross S5, and super young mills, which can be understood by studying a low energy limit of D3 brains in string theory. There's an analogous duality that comes from a similar analysis, but for P not equal to three. Um, and in this case, we have a non-conformally invariant young mills theory uh, describing a, with, with 16 supercharges, describing a supergravity geometry. The supergravity geometry is conformal to ADS2 plus P cross S8 minus P, where by conformal, I mean there's an overall Z-dependent factor in the metric. The dilaton also has a non-trivial profile in these geometries. So today I'm going to focus on the D0 brain case. Um, and we're particularly drawn to this case because here we have a system of quantum mechanics, which often goes into the name BFSS, um, dual to the near horizon geometry of a charged black hole in 10 dimensions. So a black hole described by a quantum system. Um, before continuing, to discuss that model, let me mention one interesting property of the, all the supergravity geometries, which is that under a rescaling of the coordinates, uh, the metric dilaton and p-form gauge field get rescaled in such a way that the action changes by an overall constant. So this is a symmetry of the classical equations of motion, but not the quantum theory, which really cares about the normalization of the action. So for that reason, it's sometimes called a similarity. Okay, this similarity will come in use in a second. So an interesting question to ask about this system is how does it respond to perturbations? In the bulk, these are described by black hole excitations called quasi-normal modes. Uh, these modes decay with a particular complex frequency that's fixed by the geometry of the black hole. In the quantum system, the quasi-normal modes describe the time scale for a perturbation of the thermal state to relax back to equilibrium. Um, so this is a definite prediction of the duality or a simple observable that we can predict uh, in the matrix model, matrix model using gravity. In the, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to describe how to compute those omegas. So in principle, this involves expanding the wave equation, expanding the action to quadratic order um, around this background and then diagonalizing the equations. Uh, which is moderately complicated, but there are a couple of observations that simplify the calculation. So the first is to view these, this geometry as a dimensional reduction of some uh, higher dimensional ADS space without a dilaton. So you can think of the dilaton as coming from the volume of these extra theta bar dimensions. And the second observation is um, that the equations have a scaling symmetry, as I mentioned, and this essentially fixes the masses of the fluctuations around this background. Um, so using these observations, you can easily write down the wave equation. Um, and here's an example of the quasi-normal mode spectrum for one of the gravity modes that we computed. Uh, and so in summary, basically these omegas are something you really can compute um, and they amount to a prediction for the quantum system describing this black hole. Thanks. Uh, 
Um, well, the quantum system is rather complicated. Um, so you might hope that, um, so, so I don't know how to do that computation uh, to reproduce these omegas. You might hope that someday in the future, you might be able to do a Lorentzian simulation of the quantum system and get these omegas experimentally. Um, people do Monte Carlo simulations uh, of BFSS, which are very nice, but that's, um, that's a Euclidean uh, that's a Euclidean simulation and not something Lorentzian, which could reproduce these. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next speaker is Andrea Bulgar Bulgarelli from Torino on entanglement entropy from non-equilibrium lattice simulations. Okay, so um, in this talk, I will discuss entanglement and how we can use actually Monte Carlo lattice simulations to determine the um, entanglement content of a generic uh, quantum field theory. So my setup will be um, the following one. So I will consider uh, lattice field theory and a question I'm asking is given a bipartition of this lattice, how much entanglement is shared between the two parts of the system? So uh, an observable that is widely used to quantify the entanglement in a generic quantum mechanical system is the so-called entanglement entropy that is related to uh, the reduced density matrix related to a, por a portion of my system. And other quantities that one can study as well are uh, the so-called Rini entropies that are connected to higher powers of the reduced density matrix. So uh, the most commonly used setup to actually calculate uh, Rainy as well as entanglement entropies is this called replica trick. Uh, so the basic idea is the following one. We consider the space time where the fields live in. In this example, I'm showing you a one plus one dimensional space time so that the sus subsystem for which I want to calculate the entanglement is just a line. So I'm cutting away this line from the system uh, introducing some replicas of this sculpted system, and then I'm gluing together this, uh, at the edges of this cut so that uh, I'm um, essentially considering a Riemann surface. So, and this very construction can be made on the lattice as well. And in this geometry, we can define the following uh, quantity that is called um, entropic C function that is essentially related to the derivative of the Rini entropy with respect to the size of this cut. And it can be shown that this quantity contains all the universal relevant information encoded in Rennie entropies. And uh, it's important to notice that this quantity can be expressed as a ratio of partition functions uh, in the replica space. Basically, the ratio partition function between uh, the cut with a given length and the cut increased by one lattice spacing. And this is a quantity that we can compute on the lattice. And we computed it uh, by means of um, an algorithm, a theorem uh, that is essentially the Trojinsky's theorem coming from non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And that's a way to express a ratio of partition functions at thermal equilibrium by means of uh, averages over samples of out of equilibrium trajectories, essentially. What we're doing is uh, in our specific case is to quench the geometry of the replica space by driving the system from uh, a cut of a certain length to a cut increased by one lattice spacing. Uh, and in this way, the Georgiansky theorem ensures us uh, that we are computing this quantity and we can compute it in a quite efficient way. And I want to show you an example of how we can use this entropic C function to compute uh, a relevant physical quantity. Uh, these, uh, these are really preliminary results for the entropic C function for the gauge Ising model. And uh, Klebanov and collaborators show that uh, an essentially entanglement can uh, is sensitive to confinement. So uh, as you can see, at short length scales where we can see actually free gluons, asymptotic freedom, uh, we see a lot of entanglement where at large length scale, this function drops to zero. And it's remarkable that this crossover is controlled by the inverse critical, the confining temperature of the theory. And 
I thank you for the attention. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Question? Sorry, what, what kind of tears? Yes. Well, here actually we have no uh, branch point. Well, actually, um, the cut is in the dual lattice. So essentially, the um, branch point would be in the middle of a plaquette. So actually, I don't see a clear op operator that takes the same role, but that would be an interesting question to, to investigate. Actually, it has to do with, I think, uh, the dual lattice of the theory. That's a question we are addressing, but uh, so I, I have not a clear answer for you <laughs> now. Okay, great. <clears throat> Let's thank Andrea again. And the next speaker is Shi Chen from the University of Tokyo. He'll tell us about CP broken the confined phase at theta equal pi. Oh. Okay, thank you. So uh, I come from the University of Tokyo, so almost uh, the opposite side of the Earth. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about some interesting physics at uh, set equals pi. Uh, so uh, so let's have, let us consider some four-dimensional SUN uh, Young Mills theory. So we can, of course, consider pure Young Mills, or we can add some of the joint matter. Uh, at, anyway, so according to Natty's lecture today, uh, we know that we can have a ZN one form symmetry uh, in this system. And if this ZN one form symmetry is unbroken, uh, we see that we have confinement uh, because the Wilson line will have area law. So if this ZN one form symmetry is spontaneous broken, so we can see that we have deconfinement or say Higgs thing. Uh, so, and uh, then uh, this uh, ZN one form symmetry has some interesting property. So if we couple some background gauge field to this ZN1 from symmetry, uh, we will see some interesting phenomenon, uh, which is called the instant charge of fract uh, fractionalization. Uh, that is the integral of the second chain uh, class of the gauge field uh, is no longer an integer. So it becomes uh, some fractional number. And uh, the failure of this number to be an integer can be measured by uh, some uh, cohomology class of this background gauge field. Okay, so, uh, this phenomenon has some very interesting uh, physical consequences. That is, we can see that there is some uh, mixed uh, the hoofed anomaly between this uh, ZN one form symmetry and some other symmetry. So first of all, we can see some uh, mixed of the hoofed anomaly between this ZN one form symmetry and the set angle. Well, we can regard it as some background gauge field for the U1 minus one form symmetry. Uh, and uh, the consequence of this uh, hoofed anomaly is that uh, we can never have a, a ZN symmetric and also theta uniform phase. Uh, so this is the first uh, scenario. And uh, for the uh, specific value of theta at the theta equals pi, uh, we actually have a, a mixed uh, total hoofed anomaly between ZN one form symmetry and the CP symmetry uh, at uh, this point, the theta equals pi. So, and uh, this uh, anomaly tells us we can never have a, a ZN symmetric and also CP symmetric phase at the theta equals pi. So these two scenarios are excluded by the hoofed anomaly matching condition. Okay, so uh, based on these uh, two uh, anomaly, so we can try to consider some uh, phase diagram of the system, some possible phase diagram. So here, the horizontal axis is theta and the vertical axis is some psi which parameterize uh, some parameter uh, that causes a confinement and deconfinement phase transition. So, and according to that Atufian anomaly, so this first uh, scenario must be excluded uh, because we, uh, in this region, this region is dangerous, uh, cannot uh, be matched by the Atufian anomaly. So, but however, the second scenario and also third scenario is okay. So here the red line uh, represents the uh, first order phase transition related to the CP symmetry breaking. And this uh, blue line uh, corresponds to the confinement to confinement phase transition. 
So, uh, and the natural question is, uh, so far we have this constraint on the uh, possible scenarios. So which scenarios can be really seen in the uh, physical system? So this is a question. So then we can try to uh, cook up some system. Uh, we can try to consider the N equals one super Yamus. And uh, we put it on R3 times S1. And uh, we also introduced some soft uh, SUSI breaking by a uh, light massive uh, gluino. Uh, and uh, in this kind of setup, we can try to do some semi-classical computation uh, according to uh, Mita's lecture. And uh, by this kind of computation, uh, we can find uh, some uh, effective potential uh, of this system. Okay, it's like this, uh, very ugly, but uh, the result is uh, <laughs> for uh, n is larger than q, we can realize a second scenario, but for SU2, we can realize a third scenario. And uh, especially we can see a CP breaking and the confinement phase in this case. So yeah, that's all, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, question. Hmm. Uh, some question. Okay. So, uh, uniform, I mean, for example, let's see this scenario. So, uniform means if we uh, go from the uh, set equals zero to set equals two pi, we have to encounter something. So that means non-uniform, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's thank she again. So uh, Carolina Figueiredo from Princeton University will tell us about leading singularities of gluon amplitudes from the bosonic string. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So I'm gonna tell you about a way of extracting leading singularities of gluon amplitudes from the bosonic string. Since time is short, I'll be focusing uh, on the tree level case, but everything I'm gonna say holds both the tree level as well as loop level. So let's start by reviewing what we mean by leading singularities. Let's take some scattering process, say a five point gluon amplitude at tree level. Uh, then the answer is given by uh, some of the low refinement diagrams, in particular one of them, this one over here. And we know that if we go near the kinematical locus where we put both internal propagators on shell, then the answer is actually dominated by this diagram. And the leading singularity is what we get after we take the residues where we put both internal propagators on shell. So how do we traditionally go about computing these objects? Well, factorization tells us that when we go on a residue, then uh, the answer is given by the product of the lower point amplitudes. So in this case, we get the product of these three, three points. Uh, objects, which from some QFT course, we know that the three point vertex for gluons is given by this expression over here, which has these three different tensor structures. And so this means that as we're trying to compute leading singularities of processes that involve higher and higher number of gluons for also the number of internal vertices is gonna grow. And so the difficulty to get these leading singularities grows as three to the number of vertices. So it basically grows exponentially. And the question we're trying to answer is, is there a simpler way of extracting these objects? Well, maybe the first guess would not be to look at string theory, but a very nice thing about string amplitudes is that they're given by single integrals, maybe over some very complicated set of surfaces. But in any case, it's a single integral that when we take the alpha prime goes to zero limit, gives us the contributions coming from all Feynman diagrams. And in particular, if we're interested in getting the leading singularities, we just need to look at the form that we're integrating and just compute residues of this form. So since we're interested in gluon leading singularities, we start from the bosonic string and at tree level, these amplitudes are given by this expression over here. Does not seem too bad, it fits on a line. Of course, it has all the usual problems of these stringy integrals, it does not really converge. But as I said before, for the leading singularities, we only care about taking residues of the form that we're integrating. So the convergence issues are not really a problem right now. So we have this exponential part over here in which we're meant to keep only the terms that are multilinear in all the polarization vectors, which means that actually secretly this exponential ends up being a load of terms. So just so you have an idea for six point amplitude these are already around a thousand terms. So the answer is, is there even a simpler object that we can start from, uh, from which we can extract the leading singularities just by taking residue systematically? And the answer is yes. Well, currently this bosonic string answer is, give, is giving us the answer for the case where we're considering that the external particles we're scattering are gluons. But if we instead think that these gluons 
come from scalars. So we start by this bigger problem where we're considering the scattering of two n scalars and each pair of them merges into a gluon. Then the answer actually highly simplifies to a single term. And so starting from this point, all we need to do is take residues all the way down until we reach the gluon leading singularity. So first we start by putting the external gluons on shell and this will land us on the tree level gluon amplitude. And then if we further make the internal gluons on shell as well, we will eventually uh, end in the full leading singularity. Okay, so now I'm just gonna quickly go through the idea that goes into generalizing this to loop level. Uh, and the main thing is we take this 2n scalar form that we got at tree level and think of this as the fundamental object that we're using to extract in leading singularities and ask, how do we generalize this to loop level? It's, there's some subtleties, but still you can generalize it to something that's almost as simple as in the tree level case, still just one term. Uh, of course, this is very different from the bosonic string one loop answer. Uh, starting from that point would really be crazy. But in any case, the, the low energy limit of these two n scalar form is still gluon, so it allows us to take residues all the way down to the gluon loop leading singularities. Uh, that's what I want to say. Thank you. No question. Okay, let's thank Carolina again. <laughs> Andrew Gomez uh, from Cornell will tell us about confinement and chiral symmetry breaking in AMSB QCD. All right, hi. So the, the goal for this talk, I'm going to explain to you some work we've done in learning about uh, the IR phase of non-supersymmetric, so I emphasize non-supersymmetric gauge theories, uh, S, uh, U and SO, in this talk with uh, fundamental quarks. Okay, so we're going to start by increasing the symmetry and then removing it, as is sort of a commonly done thing. So the symmetry in this case is gonna be supersymmetry. Um, uh, so in addition to the normal, you know, Parks, you have the super partners. And because of this, you get a lot of just very nice um, features called holomorphy, which allows you to understand the IR phase of the supersymmetric gauge theory uh, better than in the non supersymmetric case. Okay, but emphasis, Susie is just a theoretical tool. So we're gonna have to remove the super partners and we need a mechanism to do this. And in particular, we want a mechanism where when we do that in the UV, we know exactly how it, um, the mechanism is working in the IR. So we want something universal. And when you hear universal, Maybe you might think gravity. So we're going to use a, um, a, 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 a supersymmetry breaking me mechanism closely tied to gravity called uh, anomaly mediated supersymmetry breaking. Okay, don't have time to go through exactly what the mechanism is, but basically in the UV, it does exactly what you want. So it gives masses to the squarks and to the uh, gauginos. So in the limit of large supersymmetry super breaking, you recover exactly the non-supersymmetric theory that you care about, that, that, that you want to learn about. Okay, now into the IR. So in the IR, um, this, this is kind of the simplest example um, where the number of colors is greater than the number of flavors, but you can do it in you know, all sorts of different theories. Basically, the, the upshot is that uh, in, in supersymmetry, you have this kind of runaway potential, but the character of the theory changes fundamentally uh, when you add in this kind of supersymmetry breaking and you get a VEV for uh, the meson. The meson is a flavor by fundamental, so that's chiral symmetry breaking. Okay, so this is a demonstration of chiral symmetry breaking in SU. Um, I just talked about these theories. You can do it for all these different uh, theories here. So all these very exotic uh, phases in the supersymmetric gauge theory collapse down into the chiral symmetry breaking phase. And we were able to show um, that for a very large class, um, of these theories, this chiral symmetry breaking uh, phase is indeed the uh, global minimum of the theory. Okay, um, so we want to talk about confinement as well, but I didn't, and of course we all know by now why, because when you have quarks in the fundamental representation, it breaks the center symmetry, um, and then you don't have an order parameter for confinement, but we have a chance with SO, so we're going to consider SO gauge theory with again fundamental quarks, so NF of them, um, but there's a spinner flux tube, uh, which cannot be broken by these vector-like quarks. All right, so in one particular case, 
the, the using supersymmetry uh, in a supersymmetric theory, you have a dual theory written in terms of monopoles. This is very, this is sort of an n equals one family of the cyborg witten um, theories that we heard about before. Uh, so around this monopole point, um, here are your monopoles, there's a meson, um, and then you apply exactly the same supersymmetry breaking mechanism, and two things happen. One, uh, the mesons condense, so that's the chiral symmetry breaking that we found before, and the second thing that happens is the monopoles also condense. Okay, so it's not a true electric magnetic duality, but if we interpret it as an electric magnetic duality, then the monopole condensation signals electric confinement. So you can see this as a demonstration of confinement uh, and simultaneously uh, chiral symmetry breaking um, uh, of the continuous chiral, chiral symmetry. Okay, and then this was just for the theory of the uh, monopoles, but in fact, we can use some mass deformations to extend the results to um, basically all the theories for which um, AMSB applies. Thank you. Question. Is this minimum under parametric control, you would say, or um, the, the one where you're getting QCD like here, non CD? Um, yeah, so, so I think you mean when you raise the supersymmetry breaking scale. Right. Um, well, no, we don't have control when the supersymmetry breaking scale goes above the confinement scale, which is ultimately the limit you'd like to take. Um, but well, at least it's the right phase. So there's probably no phase transition. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, the next speaker is Tal Schaeffer from Weizmann Institute. Will tell us about a world chip theory for 2D QCD. Hi, so uh, I'll tell you guys about some ongoing work with Sofa Aroni and Suman Kundu about uh, formulating a world sheet theory for uh, uh, 2D Ang Mills. We're working based off a proposal by Aljava from the 90s. So let me give a quick review and then tell you what we're up to. So 2D Ang Mills is an exactly solvable confining theory. The partition function and all Wilson line expectation values can be expressed exactly. And the 90s, Gross and Taylor large and expanded those, exp those expressions and showed that um, they organized into a string theory in the sense that every term can be associated exactly with one map of a Riemann surface in due to two-dimensional target space. Uh, so what's needed is some world sheet action to describe this string theory. Uh, one can imagine, since not all conceivable maps appear in the uh, Gross and Taylor series, uh, one can imagine it should be some topological string theory that localizes to specific maps. Uh, so one proposal from the 90s by uh, Moore and friends uh, was uh, to localize to holomorphic maps, uh, but that only accounts for the so-called chiral contributions to the 2D and Mills observables. Uh, the non-chiral contributions are a little ill-behaved. So uh, Hojava proposed the theory that localizes to extremal area maps solutions of the Nambu-Goto equation. Uh, in other words, basically a theory of soap films. And that includes all of the maps that are implicit in the Gross and Taylor expansion. Now, both of them mostly worked at zero coupling and mills, a topological theory, and gave some vague proposals for how to extend it. So does Java's theory really work? We wanted to compute things with it uh, and to proceed to more complex theories, but we saw for one thing, um, there's a few problems. One thing is the uh, term in Java's action actually turns out to be zero when you look at it. So the moduli space integral is ill-defined, but we found some replacement for it. Also to do the uh, one loop, uh, one -loop uh, contributions in localization, we had to reformulate the theory in uh, a Polyakov-like uh, uh, formalism and gauge fix to an analog of conformal gauge. Um, we found uh, that uh, this formalism also uh, helps to naturally regulate some of those ill-behaved non-chiral maps, uh, taking them to be limits of well-behaved maps. Um, and if we want to compute uh, Wilson loop observables and not just the partition function, so for that, we uh, adapted the theory to world sheets with boundaries, where uh, the boundaries are mapped to arbitrary loops in the target space uh, uh, in the space-time. 
And uh, you, presumably it's often said that uh, if you can probably do that, properly do that with uh, finite coupling, then it should just be a matter of uh, generalizing these boundaries, uh, allowing them to fluctuate and be weighed by some mass term to describe the Etuft model of uh, fundamental quarks. So uh, down the road, um, Although we've obtained uh, thanks, the uh, correct measure on the moduli space of extramal area maps um, uh, in case where there is no boundaries to moduli space, we need to deal with the case where the moduli space has boundaries. And uh, we need to compute some more amplitudes, uh, less basic ones, and see that we're getting something sensible. Uh, generalizing to a non zero tooth coupling, Paul Java says it should be done, but uh, uh, we're not sure at the moment. Uh, I hope it can be done. Um, and, uh, and then uh, what would be really nice is really to rederive the Atuf spectrum or the Atuf equation in a manifestly stringy way. And further down the road, it's a long road, uh, generalized to uh, add adjoint particles, a theory that behaves more like a, a confining, uh, a standard confining gauge theory, uh, and to go to higher dimensions, of course. So uh, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, yes, uh, we just move on then. Thank you. Theo Jacobson from the University of Minnesota. Strings, monopoles, axions on the lattice. Yeah, we'll see if we get to all of that. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm gonna say a few words about Recent work on the modified Valan formulation for lattice field theories. This is based on some work with Tinsel and Mampasic and work in progress. Okay, so lattice field theories are not just useful for doing numerics. They also give us a nice well-defined setting where we can you know, probe various interesting quantum field theories and sort of think about their subtle aspects. Things like global symmetries, atuft anomalies, dualities, these are all things that we would like to retain when we discretize the lattice field theory. The modified Valan formulation is one way to sort of keep these things intact on the lattice. So if we were doing abelian U1 gauge theory uh, using the standard Valan formulation, we would actually use algebra valued link fields, A, they're real, uh, in addition to integer valued plaquette variables, N. These plaquette variables are like uh, gauge fields for a gauge redundancy where we shift each link field by an independent two pi multiple uh, on each link. So in this formulation, the standard formulation, a monopole on the lattice is a configuration for which uh, the exterior derivative of this discrete plaquette field is non-zero on a cube. So that's a monopole. The modified Valan formulation is where we just remove all the monopoles by hand. So we implement this local constraint. Uh, we can do it using a Lagrange multiplier and depending on the dimension, that Lagrange multiplier might be uh, dual scalar or dual magnetic gauge field. Okay, so the goal was to apply this formalism to Trent-Simons theory, uh, abelian Trent-Simons theory, uh, trying to keep as much of the global structure as possible. So level quantization, the one form symmetry and its anomaly and so on. Okay, so that's interesting in its own right. A future application would be to use this discretization to uh, provide exact non-perturbative dualities between bosonic and fermionic theories on the lattice in a way that extends particle vortex duality. So one interesting thing that came out of this construction was the framing of Wilson lines. Uh, so in the continuum, a Wilson line is not quite well defined. You need to point split it. Uh, and on the lattice, the way this shows up is that the Wilson lines are actually not lines at all, but they're ribbons. So all of the ordinary Wilson loops are actually projected out from the theory, all their correlators are zero. And what you're left with are these ribbon-like things. And you could use this structure to compute the topological spin of this line. Uh, so this is related to the Atuft anomaly for the ZK one form symmetry in Trent Simons theory that we heard about earlier today. So you could take one of these ribbons on the lattice, you twist it, and in the process you pick up a Z2K phase and that uh, tells you the topological spin. Okay, so that was fun. Uh, an interesting and sort of obvious generalization of this Trent Simons construction is to go to axion Maxwell theory. So this is a 4D gauge theory with a two pi periodic axion theta and an integer coupling K. And this model actually in the continuum has many interesting symmetries, zero form, one form, two form, et cetera. And they combine into something called the higher group. There's actually more than just these uh, 
higher form symmetries, there are non-invertible symmetries as well. Uh, but the goal is to put this theory on the lattice, study these symmetries, and mess around in a completely well-defined uh, setting. So just to give an example of the types of things that we can see, because of this higher group uh, symmetry structure, the symmetry operators don't just act on the charged operators by phases. There can be something more interesting that happens. So if we look at the intersection of two generators of the one-form symmetry, electric one-form symmetry, at the junction, you actually find the generator of this two-form axion string symmetry. Okay, this, okay, I'm, I'm showing a three-dimensional slice, but this local operator wants to act on this axion string world sheet. But because of Kallen Harvey anomaly inflow, there are actually degrees of freedom which live on this world sheet. And so when we move, okay, thank you. Uh, when we move the, uh, these operators through, you don't just pick up a phase, but you actually leave something behind on this world sheet. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Questions? What are you leaving behind? Uh, it's a Wilson line. A Wilson line that couples to the U1 symmetry of this chiral boson. All right. So uh, let's thank Sia again. Justin Kalk from Perimeter Institute will tell us about holomorphic confinement of n equal one super young mill. Young mill. Okay, thanks. This is going to be uh, kind of an update on a whole bunch of work I've been doing with a whole bunch of people. So I'll try to make it painless. Uh, yeah, so basically the idea is uh, I need to introduce the notion of a holomorphic twist. So given any supersymmetric quantum field theory, one of the things you can do with it is uh, since q squared is equal to zero, just like d squared is equal to zero in your cohomology class or whatever you did, uh, you can take the cohomology with respect to a particular supercharge. In this case, because you also know in the supersymmetry algebra, q, q bar produces you know, a tiny translation, what ends up happening is that anti-holomorphic translations become q exact. And so the twisted theory is, is, is holomorphic. So we're restricting our attention to some, some uh, like, Co some subsector of the original theory, essentially. Now, this protected subsector would, I guess, presumably be called the semi-chiral operators. And in the case you are setting a superconformal field theory, these would be exactly those counted by the superconformal index. So you could say, in principle, by computing these cohomology uh, classes of local operators, we're essentially categorifying the superconformal index. And these theories are, uh, these holomorphic theories are basically equipped with a local product structure kind of analogous to the OPE and 2D VOAs or something like that. And these actually lead to infinite dimensional symmetry enhancements analogous to the Virasoro symmetry in 2D or Katsumudi symmetry in 4D. There's also a series of higher brackets which are a little bit complicated, so I won't go into the details of them, but they'll make an appearance later. Now, I, I can't really go into the details of this either, but I'll quote the result is that the Feynman diagrams in all of these twisted theories, holomorphic twists or topological twists, must be what are called Lamann graphs or generalizations of Lamann graphs. Um, by, so here's the first two Lamann graphs. So you can then do a particular change of variables to map all of the Feynman integrals computed from these Lamann graphs into some sort of space of holomorphic loop momenta. And we call that object the operatope, or maybe because I'm here, I should call it the holohedron or something. So <laughs> you can then use various recursive identities of this operatope to uh, bootstrap all the Feynman integrals. So in our paper, we actually do this all the way up to like three loops. Uh, so now, okay, you're just naively studying this problem, blah, 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 and you say, okay, I, I want to find all of these semi-chiral operators. What are you going to do? You're going to take all the polynomials in the fields of your theory and their derivatives, and you're going to see which ones, which ones die under Q. Well, you do this very naively in the free theory, but in the interacting theory, you need to add some sort of corrections. So to do that, it turns out that you can take the original free cohomology, and then there's some new magical operator called bold Q. And bold Q is actually a sum of basically the corrections due to, uh, to a whole bunch of other Qs, which come from computing n-loop Feynman diagrams. Now, again, it's not something I can go into the details of, but all of these sort of perturbative corrections are contained in these brackets that I introduced on the previous slide. And you can kind of think of this if you've ever seen the correction to the chiral ring uh, by Cachazo, Douglas, Cyborg, and Witten via the Kinesian anomaly. You can kind of think of this as like some vast generalization of that work. So what does this have to do with uh, confinement? Well, in n equals one super young mills, if you take the SUN, like it's just a standard SUN gauge theory with an adjoint fermion, 
It turns out that if you pass to this Q cohomology that you can identify this system with a holomorphic BC system. So this is a four dimensional B holomorphic BC system. In this case, the free cohomology is just naively, you know, these gauge invariant polynomials in Bs, Cs and their derivatives. But the surprising thing we find is that then if you actually take a look at loop corrections, so for example, if you add just one loop corrections, this cohomology becomes smaller. And in particular, we find that the uh, surviving stress tensor, in fact, the derivative of the stress tensor becomes Q exact, aka it essentially becomes trivial. And since this thing generates the remaining translations, it actually means that the theory becomes topological at one loop and it stays that way with all the higher corrections. And so this is compatible with confinement because it basically means that uh, it puts strong constraints on the IR physics of the theory, because whatever it flows to in the IR must be topological when you twist it. So uh, that's a QR code, and maybe you can scan it and pull up the paper, but I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. There can be a question. <laughs> uh, is there one? Yes. yes. Uh, uh, not really. You should think of it as some sort of generalization of the OPE. So really what it's doing is it's telling you, I had some sort of generalization of the OPE, which is what the two bracket was. And you should think about these as being like some sort of, uh, it can, th those were, you know, that's well-defined on cohomology classes. It's not well-defined on chains. And so you can think about this as basically capturing how that bracket doesn't close on chains. Yeah. And so there are higher homotopical operations. Okay, let's thank Justin again. Uh, the last talk for today, uh, Ji Hun Li from Perimeter, Trace Relations and Open String Vector. Thank you. So a, a recurring theme in our study of holography is the idea that Feynman diagrams of our large end gauge theory reorganized into a genus expansion of some string theory by purely combinatorial arguments. And it's natural to ask to what extent the notion of gauge string duality can persist at finite end. And I'll, I'll explain an intriguing pattern called the giant graviton expansion that appears in the spectrum of states of finite end gauge theory on S1 cross S3 at, weak, at, at zero coupling. Namely, the finite end spectrum of a UN gauge theory reorganizes into a systematic set of e to the minus kn corrections to the large end spectrum with k summed over. And these corrections have transparent holographic interpretations in the bulk, which can be checked at the level of the index. Their contributions from K giant graviton brains and open closed string excitations thereof. So th this is a formula that seems to suggest rules in the bulk that we did not know before. Uh, for example, why is the bu full bulk partition function in the alpha prime going to infinity limit given by a sum over brain sectors? And also, why do the sum over brain sectors exhibit huge cancellations to give Z sub UN, even when we're computing the free partition function rather than the index? So uh, recall that giant gravitons were originally discovered to provide a bulk explanation for the presence of finite end trace relations. Thus, we'll answer these bulk questions by revisiting how one implements trace relations in a UN gauge theory. So the, the Hilbert space of a free and free, free finite end gauge theory is given by a highly constrained quotient module, which is a quotient of the infinite and Hilbert space and infinity modulo the ideal of trace relations over the ring of all gauge invariant polynomials of fields and their derivatives at infinite n. So the ring is over infinite n. A, a free resolution of M sub n, which is the Hilbert space of finite end gauge theory at zero coupling, um, it replaces that re with an infinite exact sequence of three modules uh, with uh, VK with differential Q hat. So it, this replaces this with the free spaces. So VK is a space of kth order relations among the generators of M infinity with a K equals to one case V1 being the space of trace relations. And we can view the free resolution of M sub N as the procedure of introducing heavy ghosts for a U infinity theory that compensate for null states due to trace relations at some given n. And um, uh, I would now like to argue the following, which is a statement that's valid modulo instantons. 
that the free module VK of kth order trace relations in a UN gates theory should be interpreted in the string dual as the alpha prime going to infinity limit of the space of open string states on K giant graviton brains sharing a closed ring background. So giant graviton brains are brains which can be dual to states in the gates theory. And uh, so the giant graviton expansion, uh, which is the formula that, that I've been trying to explain, is then the refined Euler characteristic associated to a free resolution graded by this uh, new heavy ghost number. Well, uh, that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, a question. Yes. Yeah. So indeed, um, for every n, the resolution is very different. Um, but the, the result of this resolution, so there, there, there's a unique uh, notion of uniqueness for this resolution, and it's called uh, minimal resolution. And um, if you, as you take n going to infinite, uh, the, 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 the VKs essentially stabilize up to some overall factor. And so the surprising part is that if you plug that result back in, so interpolate for finite n, uh, the result that you get for large n, uh, it's, it still a, it furnishes a resolution of a, a finite n uh, um, uh, free, free, free finite n uh, Hilbert space. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs>